Hello, everyone. Uh, as you may have noticed, I've been away for quite some time, um, and that's because I was on vacation. I was actually visiting India, um, and I don't know why I'm using this video in particular to demonstrate that I was in India, but it's the one I decided to use, so just look at it because it's great. Um, I named that cow Nelson and that dog Borgi because he kind of looks like a corgi, but not exactly. Um, but I had a really great time. Um, sorry about the lack of videos. Um, just know that I prepared several videos and I've already written them, so uh, videos should be coming back and they should be pretty good. Um, and again, if there's any topics in particular you'd like me to discuss, please just let me know. Um, this video that I wrote um, is about the Eleusinian Mysteries, and I hope you enjoy it. Take care. Bye-bye. Religious experiences can be immensely powerful and can often induce this sense of revelation um, and ecstasy and almost like this connection with something greater that transcends the self. And religious symbols can interact with the archetypal structure of the human psyche in a way that's very gripping. And this is arguably the reason that religious ideas and religion in general can have such a strong ability to seize the mind. But in ancient Greece, there was a religious experience that was so profound that it received high praise from Plato, Aristotle, um, and even Marcus Aurelius years later. And these were the Eleusinian Mysteries. The Eleusinian Mysteries were a set of initiatory rites which were open to people from all over the Greek-speaking world, and later during the Roman Empire. They were held as a ceremony in the cult of Demeter and Persephone. The word cult in this context actually means something quite different from how it's used normally. So when we hear the word cult, normally we think of, you know, drinking Kool-Aid or, or the side of Tom Cruise nobody wants to think about. But in this context, you can think of a cult as being um, a religious institution which devotes itself to one particular aspect of a polytheistic religion. So for example, there may be a cult which specifically worships Heracles or Hercules um, and specifically only him. So you may, you know, believe in and uh, take note of the other gods, but you may specifically devote yourself to a specific god. And so the Eleusinian Mysteries were a part of the cult of Demeter and Persephone. Demeter being the goddess of agriculture and fertility, um, and Persephone being her daughter, who um, ended up being the queen of the underworld. The Eleusinian Mysteries are believed to be quite ancient, possibly going as far back as the Mycenaean period, which was way before Socrates and Plato. Each year, around the fall equinox, a large procession of perhaps thousands of people would gather in the city of Athens, and from there they would walk to the city of Eleusis. They would also fast in preparation for the ritual. Once they reached the temple at the city of Eleusis, the initiates were led into a large room called the Telesterion. But after entering the Telesterion, this is where the mysteries literally become shrouded in mystery. Because each participant was, under the threat of death, forbidden from speaking about what happened inside. And amazingly, nobody apparently spilled the secret. And so there are no written records of what may have occurred inside the Telesterion during the ritual. In fact, the word mystery comes from the Greek muo, which means literally to shut your eyes. So even though we don't know any of the kind of primary details, we do know a few things. This being a cult of Demeter and Persephone, we know that it involved some kind of reenactment of the myth of Demeter and Persephone. It also involved, and this is very interesting, the drinking of a special potion known as the Kukion. There there are some more specific details that scholars have been able to kind of piece together, and I'll leave some links in the description which kind of go into these in more detail. But in this video, I specifically want to focus on how the religious experience itself may have been facilitated, and the symbolic significance of the myth of Demeter and Persephone, and why it's so um, archetypal, and why it's it gives this kind of sense of revelation. Because nearly everyone who reflected on their experiences claimed that Eleusis represented the pinnacle of what the gods could show to humankind. Plato described experiencing a blessed vision while in the temple, and Cicero, writing hundreds of years later, as, you know, the mysteries were still in operation during the Roman Empire and the Roman Republic, he also praised the mysteries and, and, made, the, and made these claims about this beautiful vision he witnessed while in there. So what could have made this experience so profound? In The Road to Eleusis, written by Gordon Wasson, Albert Hoffman, and Karl Ruck, the authors proposed that the Kukion, that potion that I mentioned earlier, was actually a psychedelic brew, prepared by the priestesses of the temple. And all the secrecy surrounding the mysteries um, was for the purpose of preventing the, the ingredients to this potion and the preparation method from um, getting loose to the public. So it kind of gave the temple this monopoly on this experience. Rook argued that the psychedelic ingredient in the Kukion was ergot, which is this parasitic fungus which is known to grow on uh, wheat, rye, and barley. 
Albert Hoffman, who actually was the first chemist to synthesize LSD, discovered that you can actually extract ergonavine and lysergic acid amide from ergot. And both of these compounds are psychedelic. It's actually important to be able to extract these compounds from the ergot because ergot by itself is actually very poisonous. This theory could explain why there's a lot of emphasis placed on wheat in the, in the myth of Demeter and Persephone and in the mysteries themselves. Demeter again is the goddess of agriculture and a lot of her myths center around wheat and the production of wheat and, and why it's so significant. This could also explain why Alcibiades, who was this you know, actually, I'm not exactly sure how I would describe him. You know, maybe like Leonardo DiCaprio's character in Catch Me If You Can, but who lived in ancient Greece. But apparently he was caught having a private Eleusinian mystery ceremony in his house. So it could be that he was giving out the kukion. Because how else could you be having the ritual at your home? Like, are you just doing the ritual? And also, like, how would you prevent people from doing that <laughs> in their homes? It seems quite likely that, um, you know, the, the actual problem with what he was doing was that he was giving out this psychedelic brew, which was supposed to be only available in Eleusis. But the kind of smoking gun, which I think greatly supports this theory, is that ergot itself has been found in clay pots um, that were used for the brewing of kukion. So whether Kukion was psychedelic or not, it's clear that regardless, an altered state of consciousness was being produced at Eleusis. And we know this because it's clear that the mysteries themselves were based on experience and based on um, engaging with some sort of ritual and that participants experienced some kind of vision. So it wasn't like a sermon where somebody would go up and, and speak to you. It was something that you personally experienced. You witnessed the vision yourself. As the scholar Regis Warrant wrote, the initiatory rites push conceptual knowledge into the background in favor of iconic visions that lead citizens to suspend their judgments in favor of revelations that need no explanation. And this altered state of consciousness may have been accompanied by actually um, reenacting the myth. Whatever occurred, it was so profound that many participants claimed that they were given a glimpse into the afterlife, and as a result, they no longer feared death. To me, that sounds quintessentially related to psychedelics. Because psychedelics can induce these very profound experiences where people seem to come very close to death because what they're actually experiencing is ego death. Um, and through this experience, they can gain a kind of psychological sense of, of death and rebirth. And the intensity of a psychedelic experience can easily carry a spiritual significance and a sense of spiritual revelation. Because when you're in these states of mind, you can encounter beings, and perhaps this is what um, Plato meant when he said that he encountered the gods. And other spiritual imagery tends to accompany these experiences. But Another factor which contributes to the potency of this experience is the mythology itself. Mythology itself is a product of the unconscious human psyche, and so in a sense can interact with the human psyche and produce a very particular effect. In fact, it's quite similar to psychedelics in the sense that it gives you this, this feeling of revelation and the sense of connection to something greater. And that explains why so many people sought Eleusis to have this experience. So the myth surrounding the mysteries involves uh, Demeter, who is the Greek goddess of agriculture, and her daughter named Persephone, sometimes uh, called Kore or Kor. Hades, who is the god of the underworld, is smitten by Persephone, and he makes a deal with Zeus to marry her. But because Persephone herself isn't aware of the deal, Hades has to kidnap her, which is what my dad did to marry my mom, by the way. Demeter is utterly devastated by this and begins this very long search to find her which also happens to take her to the city of Eleusis, where she meets the king and queen. There's a lot of details to the story, but I'm kind of giving you the rough notes version. But because she is the goddess of agriculture, crops begin to fail as she mourns. She eventually finds out that Persephone has been kidnapped, and she refuses to allow plants to grow until she is released. But because eating food from the underworld apparently causes you to be bound to the underworld and you must stay there, and because Persephone ate some pomegranate, pomegranate seeds, she's not allowed to permanently leave the underworld. So instead, a deal is made where Persephone can spend two thirds of the year above ground with her mother and one third of the year in the underworld with Hades. And during that time, Demeter is in mourning. And this happens to be during the winter months, and that's why all of the plants die during winter. And when Persephone comes back during spring, the plants rejuvenate and the crops are restored. So it's easy to oversimplify things and see this myth as like a pseudoscientific attempt to explain how the seasons work. But it's actually so much more interesting than that, especially from the psychological point of view. In fact, I made a video about Jung's essay on the myth. Um, it's quite old, and but you can still check it out because I think it's still useful. And in that video, I explained how the, the archetypal imagery in that myth keeps popping up in modern stories. In fact, I saw it recently in a movie. Uh, I forgot what it's called. It's this movie right here. So you can watch that video for the full details of the essay, but I'll just briefly summarize some points here. The myth is ultimately about death and rejuvenation. 
and the constant desire to escape death. Since as conscious beings, we are cursed with this kind of um, knowledge of our own mortality. And so it's easy to develop a lot of anxiety about our inevitable demise. The myth is a catabasis. This basically means that it's a story pertaining to a descent into the underworld. This is a very common mythological representation of the descent into our own unconscious minds. And just as physical death facilitates, you know, the entry into the underworld, ego death plunges us into the depths of our own unconscious minds. And just as Persephone eventually returns back to the land of the living, the ego will inevitably recover from this death and rejoin the land of the living. Now that sort of symbolism is fairly common, but the, but the myth itself goes much deeper than that. And is able to grant this feeling of eternality and transcendence from the confines of life. Because a person cheats death, in a sense, through their children. A part of you lives on in your offspring. As Jung wrote, This participation and intermingling gives rise to that peculiar uncertainty as regards time. A woman lives earlier as a mother, later as a daughter. The conscious experience of these ties produces a feeling that her life is spread out over generations. The first step towards the immediate experience and conviction of being outside time, which brings with it a feeling of immortality. In other words, the myth is able to produce this sense of a connection with the past and with the future. You aren't isolated to your own tiny lifespan. Rather, you will live on in some sense. And you are the living embodiment of all those who came before you. Your mother and her mother and her mother, all the way back to the dawn of humanity. You're connected to that entire lineage and beyond. And as usual, Jung explains it better than I can. The individual's life is elevated into a type. Indeed, it becomes the archetype of woman's fate in general. This leads to a restoration, or a podcastasis, of the lives of her ancestors, who now, through the bridge of the momentary individual, pass down into the generations of the future. An experience of this kind gives the individual a place and a meaning in the life of the generations, so that all unnecessary obstacles are cleared out of the way of the life stream that is to flow through her. At the same time, the individual is rescued from her isolation and restored to wholeness. All ritual preoccupation with archetypes ultimately has this aim and result. This perhaps explains why there are so many references to the initiates feeling like they had overcome their fear of death. And remember, the mysteries weren't supposed to be just a retelling of the myth, but rather an active participation in the myth, possibly facilitated by a profound psychedelic experience whereby one truly and dynamically experiences the stages of the myth. So not only is motherhood being used to understand the seasons, but the seasons cast light on the cyclical rather than linear progression of life. This really captures the significance of religious symbols and why they can be so restorative and healing, making it, for example, possible to overcome the fear of death. This is something that we've seemed to have lost in the modern world because we don't have such systems meant to instill us with profound and useful insights. Because today myths are more or less viewed as just fictional stories that may be interesting but otherwise are not very significant. But what most people don't realize is that they speak to the unconscious mind and operate at that level. Just listen for example how Apuleius described his experience. I approached the boundary of death and treading on Persephone's threshold, I was carried through all of the elements after which I returned. At the dead of night, I saw the sun flashing with bright effulgence. I approached close to the gods above and the gods below and worshiped them face to face. So something like an encounter with the gods seems, you know, unrealistic or just a product of the mind, but it can actually be psychologically very potent. So religious experiences are quite significant, psychologically speaking. And it's one of those features of religions that are that's so subtle that when you recklessly destroy religious institutions, you probably wouldn't be able to find suitable substitutes for it. Especially when you participate in the ritual itself, the effects are much stronger. It's the same reason, for example, that you take communion at church. I suspect partially that our kind of desacralization of myths and rituals is partially responsible for our declining mental health in the modern world. Jung certainly believed so, as he wrote, It is immediately clear to the psychologist what cathartic and at the same time rejuvenating effects must flow from the Demeter cult into the feminine psyche, and what a lack of psychic hygiene characterizes our culture, which no longer knows the kind of wholesome experience afforded by Eleusinian emotions. Now, I do want to talk about how we might access mythology in the future in order to kind of gain these psychological benefits. But for now, I'll allow you to feel nostalgia for a time when things were so much simpler. Anyways, thanks for watching, have a good day, and may good luck always come your way.